By the beginning of July, we had not only captured the harbour which was to give us a foothold in the positions we had taken, but in a short time we had succeeded in greatly increasing the number of our troops ashore. Troops were unloaded continuously, and in the space of some three weeks, the First Army alone had become a more formidable force than the armies of Patton and Montgomery combined during the Sicilian campaign. In addition to the two flags denoting airborne divisions, which were long overdue for a change, eleven more blue flags appeared on our operational map, denoting American divisions. Two of these were armoured divisions, the other nine were infantry divisions. Our 65-kilometre front in the American sector started from the ledge at Coman, where Gero's troops were junctioned with the British. At saint Lo, the front line passed north of this point, skirting it, went through the Carantan marshes, then crossed the peninsula Cotentin and came out to the west coast of the English Channel. This front was divided into four corps bands. Jarrow occupied the quiet section of the front on the left, call it the Ark in front of Steo. Collins, the eastern part of the base of the Cotentin Peninsula, having moved his troops there from Sherbur. Middleton, the western part of the base of the peninsula, reaching the coast at the point where Manton Eddy had previously cut the peninsula. In the English sector, Monty's 65-kilometre front turned steeply from Comon to Bayou, then cut back into the enemy defences west of Cayenne and, skirting that besieged town from the north, came to a pre-bridge fortification east of the river. In this narrow bridgehead, Monty squeezed four corps of 16 divisions, including five armoured divisions. The accumulation of forces went so fast that concentrated in Normandy Anglo-American troops already outnumbered the Allied troops fighting on the Italian front. In 25 days after the beginning of the landing, we moved to the shore more than a million Allied troops. Our naval forces transported more than 560,000 tons of various cargoes, enough to load a freight train 300 kilometres long. But even this ever-expanding bridgehead was already too small for our motorised armies. The areas occupied by Middleton's 8th Corps and Collins' 7th Corps were half submerged by flooded rivers and swamped. The whole area was covered with a dense network of hedgerows. Only on the English front near Cayenne did these hedges thin out and change to open hilly plains. But here German tanks stood in our way. As soon as we managed to establish uninterrupted delivery of supplies through the port of Sherbourg regardless of the weather, we had the opportunity to go on the offensive, which was to begin with the breakthrough of the German defences. The general order of this offensive was provided by the plan of Operation Overlord. France was supposed to be liberated in stages, and now we stood on the threshold of the first of them, a rapid rush from the grassy pastures of Normandy to the gentle banks of the scene. The whole Allied front was to turn eastwards, with Cayenne besieged by Montgomery as the axis of the turn. The pace of movement of the Allied troops to the east was to set the First Army, striking from their positions in the western part of our front. We had to make a rapid dash from the Cotentin Peninsula to the south and passing of ranches, cut off the peninsula of Brittany. Having secured a foothold in Brittany with its deep water ports, the American troops were then to turn to the east and, leaving the right of the dry sandy banks of the Loire, to reach the boundary between the Seine and Orleans, south of Paris. The troops occupying the rest of the Allied front turned their front to the east, as we advanced and moved towards the scene between the English Channel and Paris. We assumed that on reaching the Seine we would have to regroup troops and bring fuel and ammunition, and during this time the enemy would have time to concentrate against us on the east bank of the Seine all their forces in France. Eisenhower, Montgomery and I quickly agreed on the outlined plan, because it is more than all others to ensure the achievement of our two initial goals in the battle for France. The first objective was clear even at a cursory glance at the map. Our front was still facing south from the moment we landed. It was to be turned eastwards, coming in with our right wing and relying on Monty's position on the Channel coast. The second objective arose largely from the oppressive supply constraints, which cast their ominous shadow over any tactical action. The chief of the home front had repeatedly emphasised the necessity of seizing the ports of Brittany until the September storms precluded the possibility of unloading supplies directly ashore, and we found ourselves totally dependent on Cherbourg. At that time we believed that the throughput of Cherbourg would not permit the supply of more than 14 divisions. This offensive, in which the front line of our Allied forces was to move to the scene, had been planned in outline some months before in England, but now we had to refine our plans and modify them in view of the peculiarities of our position in France. 
We had already agreed that the main forces of the advancing group would be concentrated on the American section, but we have not yet come to an agreement on how best to strike. From the very first days of planning Operation Overlord, I was absolutely convinced that we must at all costs avoid traps that could delay our advance and lead to the stabilization of the front, as was the case in the First World War, in Tunisia, where the terrain was not favorable to us. We still managed to impose a fast-moving maneuver campaign on the enemy. I believe that similar tactics can be resorted to here and that in our power to make a lightning advance on France. With the mobility and firepower that we provided both British and American divisions, we could easily defeat the Germans on open ground in maneuver warfare. But in order to exploit our advantage in mobility, we had to break through a gap in the enemy's defences, rather than pushing them back step by step. Only a breakthrough could allow us to break into the enemy's rear and impose maneuver warfare, for which we were better prepared. As long as the Germans confined us to the network of hedgerows of Normandy, where we could not exploit our superiority of strength, every measly metre of ground would cost us dearly. How was it possible to turn protracted fighting among the hedgerows into manoeuvre warfare? First of all, it was necessary to find a weak point in the German defence and concentrate our forces against it. Then, having broken through the defence in this area with a powerful blow, to introduce mechanised columns into the resulting gap, not allowing the enemy to come to his senses? In selecting the location of the breakthrough, we had to be guided by the following considerations. 1. Do not advance through the Carantan swamps, which are located in the lower part of the peninsula Cotentin. Our troops could get bogged down in these swamps before they managed to make a gap in the German defences. 2. Bypass enemy strongholds, so as not to prematurely use up the offensive impulse in attacks that could cost us too much in the initial period of the breakthrough. 3. To break through the German front in this section, where there are several roads running parallel to the axis of the offensive, which would allow our mechanised columns to reach the enemy rear quickly. We had long ago concluded that the most favourable place for a breakthrough was somewhere in the 25 kilometre stretch between St. Lo and Coutances, but it would have required too great an effort to concentrate troops at this point. Some weeks earlier, we had regretfully recognised that stubborn German resistance at St. Lo might make us pay too dearly for trying to break through from St. Lo to Coutances. At the same time, if we decided to make our way from the Isthmus of Cotentin near Carantan, we would have to cross difficult marshes beforehand. Although this route seemed less difficult than the one from St. Lo, we could foresee that it would also cost us a great deal of money. A third option would be to advance directly along the road, running along the western shore of the Cotentin Peninsula from La Ae du Pai, through the peaty heather-covered bogs at Les, to Coutances. If we had succeeded in breaking into Coutances by taking this road, the enemy would have had to withdraw, having cleared the rest of the base of the Cotentin Peninsula, or he might have been encircled by our covering blow from St. Lo, by reaching the road St. Lo. Coutances, we provided ourselves with initial positions for a general offensive, which had to be preceded by a breakthrough of the German defences. On the third option, and we stopped. June 24, I gave Middleton orders to launch an offensive along the road running along the West Bank. Collins was assigned part of the strip of the Eighth Corps, passing through the Carantan marshes. He was to push the enemy from the Isthmus, while Middleton will move on Coutans. Sherberg had not yet been taken, and Collins had already received orders for a new offensive. To regroup his forces and prepare for the breakthrough, he was given only five days, including one day to rest, two on the transfer and one day each for reconnaissance and give the order to attack. It was a very difficult task even for lightning Joe Collins, and even more difficult for his troops. But I could not delay and give the enemy an opportunity to entrench. The Germans had already profited by our lack of ammunition, which forced me to postpone the previously scheduled Middleton offensive. Each morning we discovered new and disturbing signs of strengthening German defences. The 82nd Division had identified numerous minefields, and a 90th Division reconnaissance patrol returned with an alarming trophy prisoners from the 2nd SS Panzer Division. On 27 June, I discussed with Monty the plan for Middleton's offensive along the Coutances Road. This plan did not come as a surprise to the British commander, as we had discussed with him even earlier, the possibility of such an offensive instead of an offensive from the Steyl area. Three days later, Monty included this plan in his directive on the 21st Army Group, 
In this directive, he comprehensively outlined the strategic intent of Operation Overlord in connection with the advance to the scene, again emphasizing that the First Army would deal the main blow, while Dempsey's army would stiffen the enemy's armored forces at Ka. During the fighting at the bridgehead, the 1st U.S. Army was part of the 21st Army Group and reported to Montgomery as commander of the Army Group. In doing so, he showed common sense, patience and restraint, qualities necessary for the commander of Allied forces. Monty linked our movements with those of Dempsey's troops and carefully avoided interfering in the decisions of the American command, giving him freedom of action. He never allowed himself to pry into the affairs of the 1st Army, with that condescending look which he put on himself whenever he was in the company of subordinate British. I could not have wished for a more patient or judicious commander. There was never an occasion when he gave us a rash order or rejected a plan we had devised. On the 3rd of July at 5 o'clock, 30 a.m. Middleton's 8th Corps began its advance along the western coast road. We hoped that by this offensive we would secure our initial positions for a breakthrough. But in six days Middleton had advanced south only a few kilometres, and Collins' troops were stuck in the Carantana swamps. Only Ridgeway's 82nd Airborne Division accomplished its task, but it had an incentive that the other formations did not. Having accomplished the task, Ridgeway's troops had to return to England. Infantrymen cannot normally hope for such a reward. They cannot expect that, having completed 25 or 50 missions, they will be allowed to return home. An infantryman goes into battle knowing that with each new battle his chances of survival diminish. He fights on with no hope of reward or change. Beyond the river a new height awaits him, beyond the height another river. He is in battle for weeks and months, and only a wound can keep him alive and provide shelter and a bed. His comrades continue to fight, knowing that with each passing day they have less chance of staying alive. Unless victory comes, sooner or later this game with death must end in a stretcher or a grave. On the 14th of July I ordered Middleton to halt the advance on Kutansis. Overcoming strong enemy resistance and minefields, he had advanced only 11 kilometres in 12 days. Although Collins continued to advance with battles through the Carantan marshes, it was obvious that the line Kutansis low became too expensive target and did not justify itself as a starting position for a breakthrough. It is necessary, I said, to prepare for the breakthrough to stop somewhere before reaching this line. One July Eisenhower crossed the English Channel and was with us from the first day of the unsuccessful offensive Middleton on the road to Coutances. Although correspondents had already begun to quip about Monty's repeated failures at Cayon, Eisenhower seemed neither disappointed nor disheartened by the progress of our battle for the bridgehead. When the Army's command post moved forward from a farm on the coast, set up in an orchard at Columbia, 25 kilometres west of St. Lowe. Eisenhower and I went to Monty's to discuss further plans. Monty had moved his comfortable mobile command post to the American sector. Trucks and trailers were carefully concealed under camouflage, nets. At the end of the field stood a spacious tent that housed the mess tent and the ordinaries. Monty lived in a cosy trailer once built for an Italian general and captured from Rommel in Libya. Not far away, an English camper van, custom-built by Monty himself, housed an elaborate field office. Here Montgomery could hang his maps on two well-lit walls, and no one prevented him from quietly contemplating in silence and warmth. While I preferred to live, work and eat in the field, together with his staff, Monty sought solitude, housed separately from the command post of the 21st Army Group. Under him were three adjutants, an American, a Canadian personal adjutant, and an Englishman, operational for errands. A liaison detachment and guards in dark-coloured American jeeps completed this small mobile camp. It was Sunday morning when we arrived at Montgomery's command post. From the high stone bell tower above the trees came the measured strikes of a bell, and from the south, where Jarrow's station was, came the rumble of gunfire. Two German tanks that had been hit were brought to Monty's command post. One was a squat 63-ton Tiger E Mark Vi. These tanks proved to be better armed than our Sherman tanks in the mountains of Tunisia. Next to it stood a 50-ton tank Panther Mark V with wedge-shaped frontal armor, from which shells of our anti-tank guns bounced. In the massive round turret of the Tiger was mounted long-barreled 88mm gun. In the front of the tank, the armor was 180mm thick. In Europe, as well as two years ago in Africa, the Tiger was the winner in a single combat with any tank of the Allies. 
Fortunately for us, it had a weak engine with only 650 HP, and for this reason the tank often failed. Apparently, the Germans lost more Tiger tanks due to engine failures than from Allied artillery fire. The lighter Panther, or V tank, had an engine to match its weight. Instead of the formidable 88 mm gun mounted on the Tiger, it was armed with a long barreled 75 mm gun with a high muzzle velocity of the projectile. With such a gun and cone shaped hull, the Panther was superior to the Sherman tanks in terms of tactical and technical data. At first, the Sherman tank was armed with a 75 mm gun, the shell of which did not penetrate the thick frontal armor of German tanks. Our Shermans could put enemy tanks out of action only by a direct hit in the side armor, but very often American tankers complained that each German tank hit cost one or two of our tanks along with their crews. Thus, we could defeat enemy tanks only at the cost of losing a large number of their tanks, which we could not afford. Then the artillery technical department replaced the 75mm gun on our tanks with a new 76mm gun, which had a higher muzzle velocity of the projectile. But even this new gun scratched more than penetrated the armor of the German tanks. Eisenhower was outraged when he heard about these shortcomings of the new 76mm gun. You mean to say that our millimeter will not be able to take out the Panther? I thought it would be a miracle weapon in this war. Oh, it's better than the 75mm, I said, but its charge is too small. It doesn't give the shell enough live ammunition to penetrate German armor? Ike shook his head and curse. Why am I always the last to know about the damn things? The artilleryman assured me that this 76 m could handle any German tank, and now I see, damn it, that you can't handle them. Only the British found a weapon that could penetrate the thick frontal armor of the Panther. It was their old 17-pounder guns, with which they armed the Sherman tanks received under the Lend-Lees. I told Ike that the commander of an American division had seen these guns in action, and suggested that we install them in our Sherman tanks. But when I asked Monty to find out if the British could arm at least one Sherman tank in each American tank platoon with 17-pounder guns, he replied that the British Artillery and Technical Department is already overloaded with British orders. I then offered to give us 17-pounder cannons on Metiaga, but these guns also proved to be in short supply. It was quite clear that in the fight with the Panthers we would have to make do with our own forces. By this time we had already brought ashore eight divisions of long-barreled 90mm anti-aircraft guns. Like the 88mm guns, the 90mm guns were versatile guns that could be used not only against aircraft, but also for direct fire at ground targets. But like the 88mm guns, the 90mm guns were also bulky and heavy. They were difficult to move and set up in firing positions. Nevertheless, we ordered several divisions of 9TIM guns to be moved to the front to create a second line of anti-tank defense behind our Shermans. Thereafter, throughout the war, our superiority in tanks was primarily due to their quantity, not their quantity. That evening Eisenhower was relaxing, chatting with us over a trophy bottle of good wine. We pulled light disguising curtains over the windows of the tent in which we were dining. We stayed up late. A few days before, Ike had told us how he had asked a young soldier what he had done before the army. The young man replied that he was a farmer from Kansas growing wheat. How many acres of land do you have? Ike asked, perking up at the mention of his home state. Not you twelve thousand, sir. Not twelve thousand? Mike asked. How much of it is under wheat? Nine thousand, sir. And what's the yield? Oh, forty-one bushels an acre. Mister, said Ike, try to remember my name. When the war's over, I'll come and work for you. When I was a kid, I concluded to have 250 acres of Kansas wheat land was the biggest dream of any Abilene boy. Yes, sir, it was very tempting to me, and I think it would be a good thing for you too, Brad. Hey, I'd settle for 160 acres at Moberly, I replied, before leaving our dining tent and going to bed. Eisenhower asked me if we had succeeded in clearing the port of Cherbourg. Engineering units under Lee's command had begun work on the docks, and ships were trawling the harbour, where the enemy had planted contact, magnetic and even acoustic mines. Meanwhile, until Eddie captured the western tip of Cotentin, the enemy's coastal artillery continued to bombard our minesweepers. When will you move the 9th Division back? Ike asked when I mentioned Eddie. Hey, as soon as we can get them out of there. Colin says they found a town with as many as four souls surviving. As we walked through the damp grass to my truck, 
Flashes of anti-aircraft guns lit up the sky at the Omaha landing site, eight kilometers north of us. Ike stopped to look. Gunfire echoed over the beachhead. A bit noisier than London, I said. He laughed. You don't know what aeroplane shells are yet? Every year at noon on the 4th of July, the army celebrates the bank holidays with a 48-gun salute. Breakfasting with Jarrow two days before, I suggested that we honour the tradition and salute the enemy positions with live shells. Only from 48 guns. He smiled. Oh, no, no, gee. We'll fire all our guns. Eddie Cannon. That's the nickname our artilleryman Garth got from Dixon. That evening ordered the army to fire the tot salute. To artillerymen, the term top meant that the opening of fire should be so fired that all shells would burst over enemy targets at exactly 12.0 noon. Garth instructed his artillerymen to select the most important targets as targets. At precisely noon on 4 July, 1,100 shells from 1,100 guns rained down with a deafening rumble on the heads of the stricken Germans who had rushed for cover. It was the largest and most useful salute ever fired by the American army. After firing the 155mm gun, I returned to the Army Command post and found Eisenhower crouched in the back of a P-51 fighter jet. Eisenhower was about to join Quesada on a flight over the bridgehead. They both smiled shyly, like schoolboys caught with watermelons in someone else's field. Brereton warned Quesada that he would be much more useful if he were at headquarters in France than in the cockpit of a fighter plane. Eisenhower was also frightened lest correspondents get wind of his flight. General Marshall, he confessed, would have given me a kick in the pants. I had no doubt that Eisenhower's fears were well founded. While Collins raised the flag of the Seventh Corps over Cherbourg, Montgomery wasted his forces in a fierce siege of the ancient university town of Caen. For three weeks he had been throwing his troops against those armoured divisions which he himself had deliberately drawn to Caen in accordance with our strategic plan, which required the diversion of enemy forces. Cayenne was an important road junction which Montgomery might later require, but at the moment the capture of this town was of only incidental importance. The main task of Monty was to pull the German troops to the British front and facilitate our capture of Cherbourg and take the initial positions for the breakthrough. In fulfilling this task, Montgomery achieved great success. The more powerful blow struck his troops on the outskirts of Cayenne, the more compounds thrown in this sector of the German command. However, many correspondents exaggerated the importance of KN itself, and when Monty failed to take the town, they began to accuse him of slowness. But if we tried to rehabilitate Montgomery by explaining how successful he had been in getting the Germans round his finger by diverting them to Cayenne from the Coten Peninsula, we would thereby give away our design. We really wanted to make the Germans believe that Cayenne was really in the direction of the Allied main attack. Although the diversionary manoeuvre undertaken by Monty Brilliantly successful, Monty himself became the object of criticism because he overemphasized the importance of his strike on Cayenne. Had he simply confined himself to restraining the enemy, without turning Cayenne into a symbol, he would have been praised for his success, rather than blamed as he was, for the failure at Cayenne. After all, Monty's success should have been judged by the number of armored divisions that the enemy fielded against him while Collins was advancing towards Cherbourg. However, newspaper readers in the Allied countries demanded a town called KN, which Monty had promised to take but had failed to fulfill his promise. The stiffening of enemy forces assigned to Monty under the Operation Overlord plan was not calculated to enhance British national pride. After all, people generally measure the success of a battle by the rate of advance and the size of the territory occupied. It was difficult for them to realize that the greater the number of German divisions Monty drew back on himself, the more difficult it was for him to advance. For another four weeks, the British had to stiffen the superior enemy forces in this sector while we maneuvered our way into initial positions for a breakthrough. Despite the fact that public opinion in the Allied countries in the first week after our landing noisily demanded a lightning war, the British fulfilled their passive role steadfastly and patiently. Ultimately, however, the chagrin they experienced at Cayenne caused a painful reaction on their part to Patton's rapid advance in France a few months later. Having created an opportunity for our breakthrough, the British had to endure the jabs of critics who shamed them for failing to advance as rapidly as the Americans. It can be said that the keen rivalry that marred later relations between the British and American commanders psychologically was generated by this passive mission of the British on the bridgehead. By the end of June, 
Rommel had concentrated seven armoured divisions against Monty. For the American front, he was able to allocate only one such division, Stream Nervousness, which the enemy showed in relation to the British threat to Kanu, partly due to the fear, as if Monty would not break through and after a giant detour manoeuvre, did not connect on the scene with a new group of Allied troops, which will land on the coast of the Pass de Calais. The Germans assumed this was the purpose for which Patton's army, which remained in England, was intended. In carrying out our cunning plan of disinformation of the enemy, we endeavoured in every possible way to maintain this confidence in him. When, at the end of June, Monty endeavoured to relieve us at Coutances by threatening to go on the offensive, he found that units of three German panzer divisions were concentrating against a bulge formed in the Allied front line between the American sector and the town of Cayenne. Three other divisions were also reported to be moving toward the front line. Of these six divisions, five were SS divisions with modern equipment, albeit in insufficient numbers. Since at that time Montgomery also launched an offensive east of the Orne River, he became concerned about the possibility of an any counterattack. He contacted me and asked for our third armoured division as a reserve. Although I did not dispute the need to reinforce Monty with the third armoured division, I needed it even more myself for there were only two armoured divisions for my entire stretched front. Besides, I knew that when the danger had passed, we would have difficulty in getting this division back. Even more than the loss of one division, however, I feared lest the granting of Monty's request might result in the transfer of American divisions to the British command becoming commonplace. This danger was quite real, for Montgomery's manpower was already almost exhausted. By the end of the third week of our stay in France, England had sent to the front almost three-quarters of all the troops it could spare for action in Europe. Unlike the British, for us Americans, eleven divisions was only the beginning. On 20 June an officer flew from Washington with the War Department's plans, according to which 46 American divisions were to be moved to Europe by February 1945. Although the number of American troops was ultimately three times the number of British troops, we must not forget that England's contribution to Operation Overlord required an extreme strain of effort. The ultimate victory cost the English people more sacrifice, anguish and hardship than it did us. Occupying the position of the oldest Allied commanders, Montgomery gained enormous prestige. Therefore, and he himself and the English people quite logically expected that in the offensive Eisenhower 21st Army Group, will take a leading position. But in order to justify these high hopes, it was necessary to reinforce the English troops, Monty significant number of American troops. British formations in the European theatre of operations was not enough to use the 21st Army Group in the direction of the main strike. Remembering the difficulties faced by General Pershing in World War I, I strongly rejected any suggestion of putting American troops at the disposal of the British command. It was not merely that we were competent enough to direct the fighting of our troops ourselves. I could not forget the deleterious effects of combining units of different nationalities during the Tunisian campaign. I strongly opposed the transfer of American corps and armies under the command of a British army or group of armies, but even more vigorously opposed the more dangerous practice of placing individual American divisions under the British. After all, if large compounds could still defend their independence, the divisions could easily lose it. Therefore, going to Montgomery's command post to discuss the transfer of the 3rd Armoured Division, I had already made a firm decision to refuse him. If necessary, I was prepared to appeal to Ike. Monty, however, was prudent and did not insist, and when it became clear that it was possible to find common ground with him, I proposed a compromise solution. Jarrow was already waiting for me at the command post of the 5th Corps. He knew that Monty had requested that the 3rd Armoured Division be transferred to him and feared that the departure of this division would jeopardise his exposed left flank. Now it going, Brad? he asked. I unzipped my helmet, picked up a coloured pencil, and walked over to the operational map hanging on the wall. Maybe I'm not good at haggling, G, but at least I managed to get a deal for half the price. Look at this. I erased the 5th Corps boundary line and drew a new one slightly to the left in the English strip, Instead of giving Monty the 3rd Armoured Division, I agreed to take part of his strip. He, for his part, promised to send a tank brigade to cover your flank against German tanks. To L.A. Gero's fears for his exposed flank, we gave him a rubber division. 
This division was a small unit with rubber inflatable tanks and communications equipment that simulated radio communications as much as a normal armoured division. Jarrow first learned of the existence of the rubber division from a liaison officer who reported to the 5th Corps and asked Jarrow to point out where to locate the armoured division. This young man obviously thought I was crazy, Jarrow later recounted, but I had never even heard of your blown tanks before. A few days later, Monty decided to put an end to the stubborn struggle at Cayenne and take the city. Throwing all the forces against him, he appealed to the British Air Marshal Arthur Travers Harris with a request to provide tactical support from the air heavy bombers and clear the way for the attack of tanks. On 7 July, shortly before midnight, 460 Wellington night bombers crossed the channel, reached the French coast and turned inland. There they dropped their 225 and 450 kilogram bombs on the three 500 meter wide and 1500 meter deep area specified by Monty. At dawn the next day, Monty's sappers, tankers and infantrymen stormed into a stunned and cratered Cayenne. More than 14,000 buildings were damaged and destroyed during the month long battle for this ancient city. 10 centuries ago, it was home to the Norman Duke who went down in history after conquering England as William the Conqueror. By 10 July, Monty had broken the enemy's resistance. It took him 33 days to take the city, which he hoped to capture on the first day of landing. Having entered the attack on Coutances in the Column of Failures, I began to look for a new springboard on the maps, from which it would be possible to make a breakthrough of the enemy's defence. By this time, I had to admit that the exit to the road St. Lo. Coutances would cost us too much and therefore decided to stop at an intermediate boundary, not reaching this road but whichever boundary we chose, the initial position had to be in a dry place, and we could reach a dry place only by sneaking through the quarantine swamps, which was inevitably connected with close fighting, characterised by slow advance and heavy losses. It makes me sick to my stomach to think of having to fight our way through these swamps. I said to Thorson, but I don't see any other way. What do you think? Tubby's long, thin face crinkled. Sometimes you have to make expenses to make money. I don't like the slowness myself, but we have to grab a firm foothold before we start breaking through. I went back to my place to look at the maps. Our bridgehead was expanding beyond the map hanging in my staff van. We had to add a few more sheets to it. The daily situation map took up the entire side wall, and there was no place to hang another map on which to develop plans. I instructed Hansen to set up a tent next to the motorhome, and in it stretch a detailed map of the bridgehead on the largest board he could find. There were not enough tents at the command post, and the commandant of our headquarters made a fuss when Hansen took away the tent that had been the mess tent to accommodate the large map board. The rains had loosened the ground, and when Hansen ordered the boards to be planked, the commandant couldn't stand. You're spoiling the old man. Is it unheard of to have a wooden floor in a field tent? Two nights in a row I walked on dry floorboards, drawing boundary lines, raising roads and rivers on a large 2.5-metre map of the bridgehead. When at last my plan could be determined from the map, I called first Hodges, then Keane, Herson and Dixon to hear their considerations. By 10 July a plan was finally drawn up, which Thorson called Cobra. But the plan was destined to become known as the Normandy Breakthrough. It was the most decisive battle in the war we fought in Western Europe. The breakthrough was of the utmost importance, for it immediately dispelled any doubts about the outcome of the war. As long as the enemy was restraining us on the bridgehead, he could still hope that we would negotiate with him and make peace. But as soon as we broke through from the bridgehead and moved swiftly through France to the German border, the Germans' last hopes for a German victory, or at least a protracted war burst like a soap bubble. From a pile of stones in what was once the ancient fortress of St. Lo, goes straight as an arrow road stretching 30 kilometres. It crosses the Norman groves, reaches the small town of Peria, and goes on to the west coast of the Isthmus of Contantian. Smote from St. Leto to Peria was to replace the motorway from St. Lo to Coutances as our starting point for the breakthrough. On the north side of this road, the Carantan marshes are replaced by dry soil and to the south another 40 kilometres towards Brittany stretches a gradually thinning network of hedgerows. A few kilometres from St. Lo, I drew a rectangle 6 kilometres wide and 2.5 kilometres deep on the road to Peria. Two trunk roads ran south through this rectangle, as well as several country roads. According to the plan, Cobra enemy should have been first of all suppressed by massive aerial bombardment in this area. 
By the way, it was the thought of massive bombardment and made me pay attention to the road to Peria, easily recognizable from the air. It was a long straight line separating our positions from the German ones. Bombers, I reasoned, could fly parallel to this road without fear that they would not recognize our front line. According to the plan, after bombarding the square from the air, we would break through the enemy defenses with the forces of two infantry divisions. One of them would extend the breakthrough area towards the right flank, the other towards the left flank, all the way to the Via River south of St. Lowe. Once both flanks of the breakthrough were secured, motorized infantry and two armored divisions would enter the breakthrough. The motorized infantry moved towards Kautansis, 25 kilometers to the southwest, with the task of bagging the remnants of the seven German divisions restraining Middleton. Meanwhile, tanks were rushing towards Avranches and from there to the Brittany Peninsula. In order to begin Operation Cobra, we had to first close to the road to Peria. I concentrated Collins' corps on a narrow section of the front and aimed it at the rectangle at St. Lowe. Corlette was to break through to St. Lowe and capture this junction of roads to enter the breakthrough troops of the second echelon, and Middleton was to force the marshes in the meantime and be ready to begin the advance on Coutances as soon as we broke through the rectangle exposed to aerial bombardment. As commander of the corps operating on the main line in Operation Cobra, I have outlined the self-confident and ambitious Collins. To carry out the breakthrough of the enemy defences and cover the flanks, I allocated to his disposal of the 9th and 30th Infantry Division. Then, to ensure the swiftness of the offensive, I placed in the 2nd Echelon behind them 1st Division. By this time, the 1st Division had already been resting for over a month on a quiet front near Coleman. For us, there was no problem in choosing armoured divisions to put them into the breakthrough, as we had only two divisions. The 2nd Division, Battle Hardened, and the 3rd. All three divisions were supposed to be transferred to the initial positions just before the offensive began, and even then only at night with careful camouflage. At a meeting held a week before the start of Operation Cobra, Eddie irritably stated that the 9th Division was allocated too wide offensive strip. The breakout area is too big even for two divisions, he complained. Well, in that case, how about one more division? I asked, turning to Collins. You can have the 4th Division? That division has just been pulled back from the front line for a rest. Tubby Thorson's face stretched, and I laughed. Hmm, damn it, I never thought we could give up a division so easily, I said. No. Too easily, he retorted. Now we've thrown everything we've got into the fight. There's not a single division left in reserve, just a Norwegian-American battalion, one battalion in reserve for the whole damn First Army. We never had that many troops in Tunisia, I reassured Thorson. What else do you want to have? I asked, turning to Collins again. You have absolutely everything now except my revolver. Collins held out his hand to me. While Middleton was fighting his way to Coutances, the 90th Division had again failed, this time under Landrum's command. The task before me was to replace Landrum with another man who could shake up the division. To this end, I set about studying the list of brigadier generals. I settled on the names of Raymond McLean and Theodore Roosevelt. In considering Roosevelt's candidacy, I remembered how Eisenhower and I, back in Sicily, had decided that since Teddy neglected discipline, he would probably not be able to go beyond one star. The soldiers I ID's Teddy, I explained to Wyke, but he's too soft-hearted to command a division, and not much different from his guys. But what the 90th Division needed now was not a strict chief to maintain discipline, but a lively and brave man who could lead the division unaided into battle and inspire confidence in the soldiers. If anyone met these requirements, it was Ted Roosevelt. If he was given a strict and demanding man to assist him, I reasoned, in a couple of weeks Ted could lead the 90th Division to fight the Germans, on 13 July, almost at midnight, I made a telephone call to the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, intending to inform Ike of my recommendation. However, Ike had already gone to bed, so I contacted Bedell Smith. You want to give the 90th to Ted? He shouted into the phone, which was not very audible. All right, Brad, I'll talk to Ike about it in the morning. Only Ike, as theatre commander, could send a recommendation to Washington for Ted's appointment. Bidell called me early the next day. I had not yet sat down to breakfast. The Roosevelt issue is settled. Ike has endorsed your recommendation. It's a good fit. It's too late, Bidell, I replied. 
Ted died of a broken heart at midnight last night. I was informed of it by telephone from the 4th Division, to which he was assigned. The heart attack came on suddenly and Ted, which was hard to believe, died peacefully in his tent. After leaving the 1st Division in Sicily with Terry Allen, Roosevelt was assigned to General Henry Giraud just as the French were beginning their invasion of Corsica. There, at the age of 56, he took part in the third landing operation. Throughout the autumn he was uncomfortable amongst the staff officers and longed with all his heart to go back to where the real war was being fought. At last, finally exhausted, he wrote to me in England, begging me to give him some work connected with the invasion. If necessary, I will swim across the channel with a 105 meme howitzer on my back, he wrote. Anything to help me get out of this rat hole. The 4th Division had not yet been shelled, and it was hard to foresee how it would behave offensively. If Roosevelt was in the first wave of the landing force, no one better than he would lead the assault on the coast. Sid knew no fear. He strolled carefree under fire, good-naturedly mocking the soldiers who rushed for cover and urged them forward. I wrote to Ted that I could offer him only one thing, to land with the first wave of the 4th Division's paratroopers on the Utah section and show the untrained soldiers how to behave under fire. You will probably be killed during the landing. I wrote him. Ted did not reply to my letter. He broke out of hospital in Italy, where he was sick with pneumonia, and a few days later came to me in London still tormented by a high fever. Few men have deserved the post of division commander to such an extent as Roosevelt, but we delayed too long in appointing him. He defied death with such indifference that thousands upon thousands of young men forgot their fear when they looked at him. I have never met a braver man and a more devoted soldier. While we were working out the final details of the Operation Cobra plan, a delegation of Russian military observers came to visit us. They came again during the breakthrough and several more times in the autumn. In belted tunics, breeches and Russian boots, the Soviet officers poked their noses in everywhere, going into all the details of our actions on the bridgehead. They were particularly interested in our supply methods. The sheer number of lorries amazed them. We, for our part, welcomed them warmly and did not conceal anything from them. The Englishman who accompanied them was less expansive than we were. An old employee of the English embassy in Moscow, he spoke of the Russians with restrained dislike. When we jokingly asked these blokes about the Red Army, he told Hansen in confidence. They either evade or tell untruths. We thought at the time that the English brigadier general was too harsh in his judgment of our allies. The Russians proved to be very scrupulous about rank and greeted us in strict accordance with their ranks. The senior young admiral walked ahead of the two Red Army generals. He was trim and emphatically correct, but his face was impassive. During their first visit, the Soviet representatives had asked permission to visit a German prisoner of war camp. As they wandered around the camp, one of the Soviet officers stopped near a tall, muscular German captain with parachutist stripes. What do you think is in store for Germany after we win the war? The Russian asked in fluent German. The parachutist flinched, then straightened up resolutely. Mm. Germany, he said, will obviously be fragmented into small pieces. Mm. Not Germany, the Soviet officer slowly pronounced the words, not Germany, Herr Hauptmann, but the German. By mid-July, we began to feel the growing impatience of the correspondence, to whom it seemed that a stalemate had been created on the bridgehead. Middleton's advance on Coutances had at first awakened their hopes, but then caused them even greater disappointment. Those of them who had expected the capture of Kayen to signal a breakthrough for the Allied forces returned disappointed to their dismal press camps, convinced that the British were making no further advances. It had been raining incessantly for weeks, and the bridgehead was shrouded in a gloomy cover of grey clouds that confined aircraft to the ground while the enemy pulled up reinforcements unimpeded. As Cornet's 19th Corps scrambled through thick brush to St. Lowe and Collins's unit slowly crept across the Carrington marshes, correspondents increasingly began to ask whether the Allies had learnt anything since they crawled out of the trenches in France 26 years ago. These gloomy sentiments were most vividly expressed in one newspaper report that appeared two days before the breakthrough. It was written by a very well-known correspondent who had succumbed to the atmosphere of despondency that prevailed in the press camps. The correspondent attributed the stagnation on the bridgehead to excessive caution. Critics of General Bernard Montgomery's strategy, he wrote, accuse him chiefly of endeavouring to act for certain and thus making caution a vice. 
the United States Army has always acted in such a way that it cost it as little loss of men as possible. Such tactics proved contagious and influenced the actions of the British command. At that point, we could only grin and patiently bear all the jabs. The plan of Operation Cobra was quickly taking shape, but we have not yet dared to report it to correspondents. The enemy was already showing signs of anxiety on the Carantan front, and by mid-July had gathered the remnants of his 12 divisions against us. What worried us most was the transfer of two German panzer divisions from the Monte sector to our sector. More than anyone else, I was sick of the slow advance, inch by inch, through the bushes of saint Gelo and the swamps of Carantana. It infuriated me to think that while we were on foot, bogging down in the swamps, advancing towards the road to Peria, our powerful vehicles were standing idle under camouflage nets. Nevertheless, until we reached our intended starting positions, we could only creep along, accepting heavy casualties. Although I was aware of the increasing criticism from correspondents, I felt that we did not have to justify ourselves to anyone and prove that we were making progress. At the end of the first week after the landing, we had consolidated the bridgeheads. During the second week, we cut off the Cotentin Peninsula. During the third week, we captured Cherbourg. During the fourth week, we began to advance from the Isthmus. And by the end of the fifth week, we had developed a plan for Operation Cobra and prepared for a breakthrough. Danan, who was familiar with our tactics during the Mediterranean campaign, would not have believed that we had learnt nothing and deliberately wasted forces in a battle developing at a snail's pace. In Tunisia, we broke through heavily fortified positions to start a manoeuvre war, but there we also found it necessary to first seize a springboard using infantry and then throw in armoured forces. It was madness to talk about a lightning war until the Carantan swamps were cleared, where we had only a few roads at our disposal. First of all, we had to reach terrain with hard ground where our tanks would have an open path in any direction. Besides those critics who accused us of cowardice, there were some who looked for signs of conspiracy against the Reds in our tactics. One English journalist asked whether our sitting out was not part of a plan to exhaust the Russian forces by leaving them alone to fight the Reds. And an American journalist told me a week before the breakthrough that, if such were our intentions indeed, we would lose the right to take part in the post-war ordering of the world. I assured him that we were not treacherous and advised him not to rush to judgment. Wait a week or so before making a final judgment, I said, wishing I had been able to tell him about the Cobra plan. The accusation that we were secretly plotting something against the Soviets was nonsense. I knew no more about the Russian advance than any reader, and in fact even less, since I rarely read the newspapers. Until we reached the LB and faced the problem of meeting the Red Army, I fought on, remaining in complete ignorance of Soviet intentions. Even when the Red Army had advanced considerably and was 160 kilometers away from our troops, with the gap between us narrowing every day, we mapped the position of the Soviet troops based only on the information broadcast by the BBC. It was our only channel of communication with the Soviet command. While Collins developed a plan of action troops in Operation Cobra, Quesada, with all the fervor of a young man eager to get to Paris as soon as possible, determined to develop a plan for air operations. He placed the command post of the 9th Tactical Air Command in a meadow near our command post. There, behind a hedge, he put a converted car repair shop that served as his accommodation. A wide open smile, shiny green trousers and a wrinkled, but dashingly puffed cap made Quisada look like a simple pilot, shirt guy. But in fact he was a brilliant, demanding and courageous commander of the air support of ground troops. He came to the war as a young man full of initiative, unencumbered by the prejudices and theories on the use of tactical aviation, which were stuffed with many of his superiors. For Cuisard, the fighter was still a little-known weapon with vast, uncharted possibilities in support of ground troops. He felt it was his duty to explore these possibilities. In England, Cuisada initially experimented with increasing the bomb load of his fighters, hanging heavier and heavier bombs under the wings and under the fuselage in ever-increasing numbers. He even turned a squadron of high-speed Spitfires into a squadron of fighter bombers. When the British began to protest against this treatment of the fighters, which were their pride, unperturbed Quisada replied, But these are no longer your aeroplanes but mine, and I will do whatever I want with them. These experiments reached a climax on the day when Quesada suspended a pair of 450 kilogram bombs under his P-47 fighters. Having broken through a gap in the enemy defences, 
Collins's tank and motorised columns were to rush towards Brittany, disregarding their flanks and rear. Each column was to be covered by fighter bombers from morning to evening, protecting the troops from enemy ambushes and helping to break through strongholds. In this way, the aviation conducted reconnaissance and attacked all objects that hindered the advance of the columns. To communicate with the aircraft, the commander of each column was assigned a special liaison group. Can you provide our columns constant radio communication with the aircraft? I asked Cavezard. Of course we can. He grinned, but it will be difficult for my guys to operate with your columns. They will have to move in open jeeps while yours are in tanks. Why not put your air liaison teams in tanks? Are you serious, General? He asked. By God, that would be great. But we'll have to see if our radios can operate if they're mounted in a tank. Hmm, fine, pet. I'll send a couple of Shermans to your command post by noon. Quesada left, and I instructed the Chief of Artillery and Technical Service to immediately send to the disposal of the 9th Tactical Air Command two tank Sherman. The duty officer glanced at the record he had made of his phone call with me. 9th Tactical Air Command, he thought. No way, because that's aviation. What the hell are they going to do with tanks? What a damned old man. He was obviously referring to Manton Eddy's 9th Infantry Division. Two Sherman tanks rumbled into Eddy's command post. The duty officer drove them back. Hmm, that's not for us, he told the drivers. There's obviously been a mistake. We don't need tanks. I got a call from the Artillery Technical Department. We're here about those tanks, General? Oh, oh, about the two tanks for Peter Quizard. I asked, has he received them yet? You mean General Cavessard, Quisard of the 9th Tactical Air Command? Yes, they should go to the neighbouring command post. No, damn it, my contact muttered. Something clicked on the phone and I hung up. When the tanks finally arrived at the Quisard command post, the staff officer on duty wanted to send them back immediately. The Air Force is here, he protested. What the hell are we going to do with them? It was not until late in the afternoon that the tanks were finally handed over to the aviators and the tests began. The radio worked well and Quesada now had his own armoured forces. The use of bomber aviation in Operation Cobra to make a passage for tanks and infantry was essentially no different from normal artillery preparation. The purpose of air and artillery is to pave the way for the offensive, to destroy or demoralise the enemy and force him into hiding places. We expected that aerial bombardment would destroy or overwhelm the enemy in the breakout area. Initially, Garth objected to our proposal to use strategic aviation, preferring to punch a hole in the enemy's defences with his guns. Had he had ten times as many guns available to secure the breakthrough, I would obviously have sided with him. But Garth could not provide the tempo and density of fire I desired. He had neither enough guns nor ammunition to do so. By reinforcing our artillery with strategic aviation, we could deal the enemy a crushing blow and deprive him of the opportunity to bring in reinforcements. As early as 1939, when some of my army colleagues were under the illusion that defensive means were superior to offensive means, Bedell Smith and I argued that German aircraft could make a narrow passage in the Maginot Line by bombing it heavily. However, the validity of this theory was not confirmed until 1943 in North Africa, when General Anderson, concentrating four divisions on a front normally occupied by two divisions, broke through to Tunisia, supporting the action of the troops of tactical aviation with 2,600 aircraft sorties. Strategic aviation was first used on a large scale on 15 March 1944, when Mark Clark dropped 503 heavy bombers to bomb Monte Cassino. But Clark's aim was to capture the site, not to make a passage for troops by aerial bombardment. The bombardment of Monte Cassino did not break the enemy resistance. Moreover, rumours reached us in England that some of the bombs were dropped on the positions of Allied troops, and such facts could discourage the use of strategic aviation for strikes on tactical objects. Even area bombing at Cherbourg was not particularly effective, but there we used only medium bombers and fighter bombers for this purpose. Monty's offensive at KN showed us in the most convincing way how to apply strategic aviation in a tactical offensive. But Montgomery also experienced difficulties. The heavy bombs of British bombers had turned the terrain to such an extent that Monty's tanks could not pass until the bulldozers had filled in the craters. In the weeks leading up to the development of the plan for Operation Cobra, 
I had endeavored to locate enemy troop concentrations in order to try to destroy an entire division with strategic airstrikes. While I was searching for such a goal, I suddenly thought, why not combine this task with a breakthrough that is, first defeat the division from the air and then break the front in this area? By 18 July, the development of the plan of Operation Cobra was completed and Montgomery approved it. The next day, I flew to the headquarters of Lee Mallory near London to coordinate the plan with the Command of Strategic Aviation. Hansen appealed to the headquarters of the 9th Tactical Air Command with a request to borrow aircraft C-47 to fly across the English Channel, but was refused. Not wanting to resort to Crusader's patronage, I got into a patched-up C-78 that had been requisitioned a few weeks earlier in England by Adjutant Conti Hodges. It was a twin-engine, four-seat aircraft with a canvas-clad fuselage designed for initial training of multi-engine crews. After fastening my parachute buckles and donning my Ma West life belt, I sat in the co-pilot's seat. Hansen sat in the back seat, holding two aluminum cases containing our Operation Cobra plans and maps. I clutched the third case between my knees. We set course for Selby Point and half an hour later, rounding the marshalling yard at Harrow, landed at North Holt Airfield. I was met by Brereton and Conningham. They looked ironically at our C-78 as it pulled up to the hangar. A few weeks later, two e-spouts allocated me a new C-47, with a crew from the Transport Aviation Command stationed in England. This aircraft, named Mary Kay in honour of my wife, was at my disposal throughout the war, and even for several years after the end of the war. It was not until 1948 that it was transferred to the military school at West Point. The pilot, Major Olwyn Robinson of San Antonio, a former assistant pharmacist in the Navy and a skilled radio operator, is still in my service. I have never flown with a pilot whose judgment and skill I trusted more. Lee Mallory's command post was at Stanmore, in a derelict large mansion fronting onto a neglected garden with the spires of Harrow visible beyond. In addition to Tedder and Speyerts, Lee Mallory invited British and American commanders of strategic and tactical aviation. Among the officers in ceremonial aviation uniforms looked strange dressed in a civilian woolen suit Sully Zuckerman, the British Air Force's bombing expert. With this Zuckerman, Spayatz had had a strong argument the previous spring over which strategic targets should be bombed first. Zuckerman insisted on bombing mainly railway communications, while Spayatz suggested that oil refineries should be bombed first in order to limit the enemy's aircraft and create a tense situation for manoeuvring his ground troops. Spanatz's far-sightedness paid off during the Battle of the Ardennes, when von Rundstedt's tanks stalled for lack of fuel. At Lee Mallory's invitation, I quickly outlined the plan for Operation Cobra, emphasizing that we had chosen the road to Peria because it could serve as a good ground reference point for heavy bombers on approach to the target. If the bombing strike were to take place in the morning, the aircraft could come in from the sunny side and keep a course along the road west to Peria. But even if the weather delays the departure of the bombers until the afternoon, the Air Force could easily change its route and fly from the west on the sun side towards St. Lo. In either case, the road to Peria would serve the bombers as a reliable landmark that would help the aircraft avoid being bombed by mistake by American troops on the north side of the road. To eliminate any chance, Collins' troops were withdrawn 1,500 metres north of the Perrier Road. Dunton Eddy initially protested this order. He did not like the thought of having to give up a strip of land a kilometre and a half wide, for which he had fought so desperately, and for which he might have to fight again. But I did not want to put our troops at risk by allowing my aircraft to bombard targets in close proximity to our lines. Furthermore, I had insisted from the beginning that the aviation be confined to dropping 45 kilogram fragmentation bombs. These small bombs ensured not only greater target density, but also did not make too deep craters that made it difficult for Monty to advance towards sky. This limitation automatically precluded the use of British aircraft in Operation Cobra. The compartments in the fuselages of British aircraft were not adapted for such small bombs. Air Command took to the Operation Cobra, perhaps with even more enthusiasm than our ground troops. For him, the bombing of enemy positions at Sand Low was an exceptionally convenient opportunity to test the possibility of suppressing the defence from the air. Lee Mallory offered to allocate as many bombers as the Allies had never before raised simultaneously in the air. Learning of my reluctance to involve the British Air Force, he was very disappointed, although he agreed with me that an excessive number of funnels 
would create serious difficulties for the action of our ground troops. At noon, when we left Northolt for France in Brereton's C-47 aeroplane, I secured the commitment of the Air Force for a much more powerful raid than I could have hoped for before. Collins, on hearing from me of the promise I had received, was sceptical of my words. He later confessed that he wondered if I had exaggerated the whole thing. After all, we were to be supported by 1,500 heavy bombers and 396 medium bombers and another 350 fighter bombers. A total of 2246 aircraft over 13 square kilometres of Normandy bushland. Each of the 1500 Liberator and Flying Fortress. Aircraft took 40-45 kilogram bombs, meaning all the bombs were enough to dot the bombed area with 60,000 craters. Operation Cobra, we plan to begin a 20-minute raid of 350 fighter bombers on a narrow strip of front along the road to Peria. They were to be followed by heavy bombers at an altitude of 2,500 meters and to handle the enemy positions for an hour. When the last group of heavy bombers had dropped their load, Collins' three shock divisions would rush forward supported by a thousand-plus guns as Collins moves towards the road to Peria. 350 fighter bombers will again bomb a narrow strip on the northern edge of the rectangle. As soon as the fighters had bombed out, medium bombers would appear and for 45 minutes would treat the southern edge of the rectangle while the officers of the air headquarters in England made with the help of counting rulers scrupulous calculation of the time of dropping bombs by echelons of bombers. A tank sergeant made of scrapped metal, picked up in one of the German roadblocks, a device which, finally, was to provide our tanks superiority when acting among hedges and bushes. The invention was extremely timely. The hedges that hindered the actions of our tanks in Normandy stretched not only through the breakthrough strip, but also further, along the entire path along which our troops were to move, for the success of Operation Cobra. It was important that our armoured forces were able to break freely into the enemy rear without reducing the pace of advance in overcoming the bushes. Previous attempts to overcome the Normandy hedges had failed. Our Sherman tanks did not break through the hedges, but crawled over them, exposing their unprotected armoured bottoms to enemy fire, with their guns helplessly cocked upwards. One morning, less than a week before the operation, Jaro called and asked me if I could come and see him at the 2nd Division. Hmm. Take your artillery chief with you, he said. We'll show you something that will make your eyes pop. I found Jaro and several of his staff officers at a light tank, to which a crossbar had been welded. Four fang-like teeth protruded from the bar. The tank lurched backwards, then lunged forward towards the hedge at 16 kilometres per hour. Its fang sank into the wall, preventing the tank from surging upwards, and the tank burst through the hedge in a cloud of dust and mud. Sherman, having the same contrivance, repeated the operation. It also crashed into the hedge, and instead of thrusting its nose upwards, burst forward. To the point of being ridiculously simple, what the army had been stumped for more than five weeks before, the inventor of the invention was 29-year-old Sergeant Curtis Kalin, Jr. of New York City. Midaris rushed to the command post and ordered all artillery and technical units in the army to work around the clock to produce the new anti-fence devices. The material was the underwater barrages placed by Rommel off the coast. A few hours later, Midaris flew to England to utilize the workshops available there. At 18 hours, it was discovered that we were short of welding equipment, and two hours later, a plane was on its way to England. The next morning, when the plane returned, lorries were already waiting at the aerodrome. A week later, Three out of every five tanks assigned to participate in the breakthrough were fitted with anti-fence devices. Kalin was awarded the Legion of Honor by the Corps commander for his invention. Four months later, he lost a leg in the Gurchin Forest and went home to New York. Operation Cobra was scheduled to begin on 21 July. However, the day before the sky over the bridgehead clouds expected rainy weather, but Eisenhower was so eager to begin the implementation of our plans that despite the bad weather went to us on a bomber B-25. It was the only aircraft we saw in the air that day. You'll break your neck if you fly a B-25 in this weather, I told him. Mike flicked the ash off his cigarette, a tired smile sliding across his face. This, it's one of the privileges of my position, he said. No one here can forbid me to do it. Back at the aerodrome later, Mike looked longingly at the frowning sky. When I die, he said to Hansen, don't bury me until it's pouring rain. This damned weather will drive me to my death. 
In the evening, I received a call from the headquarters of the Allied Air Expeditionary Force in England, informing me that Operation Cobra, scheduled for 21 July, must be postponed until more favourable weather. In the meantime, the enemy began to show increased interest in the area where we intended to make a breakthrough. Two German panzer divisions had been transferred from the Monte Front near Cayenne to the American sector. This increased the number of German troops against us to nine divisions. Division numbers now meant almost nothing, as they were improvised formations, hastily assembled from all sorts of leftovers. Five armoured divisions remained on the front against Monty, and we hoped that he would be able to keep them there until the offensive began. However, as fresh units approached, the enemy tried to withdraw tanks in reserve and replace them with infantry, despite Allied air raids and a severe shortage of transports. The Germans showed the ability to restore their forces amazingly quickly. They increased the number of divisions in the West on the day of the Allied landings from 58 to 65. But even this build-up of forces could not hide the fact that the enemy's position was becoming increasingly serious. Although Rommel still spoke of eliminating the Allied bridgehead, it was quite clear that his words were intended primarily to raise the morale of the Germans. Von Rundstedt had already been made a scapegoat and removed as commander-in-chief in the West for failing to prevent the invasion. Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, a grey-haired Prussian junker, was appointed in his place. As soon as von Kluge took office, Operation Cobra undermined his reputation. Von Rundstedt managed to avoid defeat a second time only because he was removed from his post in time. He had succeeded the first time at Moscow in 1941. Although the enemy's 7th Army tried, despite heavy fighting and heavy losses, during July and August to shackle us on the bridgehead, the German High Command did not take measures to reinforce it with troops from the Pars de Calais area. There, while decisive battles were fought on the bridgehead for seven weeks, the German 15th Army expected an invasion that never came. It was still convinced that the main blow would come from the Allied forces led by Patton through the narrow part of the Pass de Calais Strait. Thus, at a time when von Kluge suffered defeat after defeat in the Battle of France, 150 kilometres away, the enemy held idle 19 divisions, playing right into our hands by giving in to the biggest deception in the history of this war. The enemy was defeated in France, not only due to the actions of aviation and great mobility of the Allied troops, could not have won such a decisive victory if the German general staff had not mothballed his 15th army, thus committing a major military mission. During the decisive struggle to build up forces in the first two weeks of the invasion of Normandy, we counted most of all, first of all, on aviation, which was to close all the approaches to the bridgehead and delay the transfer of enemy reinforcements, and secondly, in the diversionary action in order to shackle the enemy in the area of Pas de Calais while we will smash in pieces of his troops in Normandy. Our plan of disinformation was designed to deceive the enemy on a large scale. The plan was based on skillful deception of enemy agents known to us, on false radio messages and the creation of a false invasion fleet. Its purpose was to mislead the enemy into believing that we had concentrated a whole group of armies on the east coast of England for the main strike against Pas de Calas. The false headquarters of this fictitious grouping was to be the headquarters of the first American army group. Patton, whose arrival in England was widely publicized, was portrayed as the commander of the invasion army, part of this army group. While British intelligence supplied the German agents in England with fictitious data regarding the fictitious invasion, we set up a special radio network to simulate the feverish activity of a group of armies, supposedly preparing for an assault across the pass to Calais Strait. At the mouth of the Thames and along the east coast of England, engineers built mock-ups of ships whose only role was to produce distinct images on aerial photographs of enemy aircraft. During the bombardment of the French coast before the invasion, aircraft suppressed enemy defences in the Pass de Calais area, with the same vigour as on the Normandy coast. Developing a plan of disinformation in preparation for Operation Overlord, we hoped only for some delay a week or at most two, until we were able to concentrate on the bridgehead enough divisions to gain a foothold on the Normandy coast. We believed that the enemy would quickly reveal our deception as soon as he discovered the number of troops landed in Normandy. But he believed in our intentions so much that by the end of June, he was still holding his troops in the Pasta Calais area, confident that he had outwitted us. When we expanded the bridgehead in Normandy, the Germans moved there from Brittany almost all their troops, except garrison troops. 
They cleaned up what was left in southern France, despite the growing threat of Operation Enville, to find reserves. The enemy went to a significant reduction of garrisons in Norway and Denmark, and despite these efforts, 19 divisions on the precipitous shores of the Pass de Calais continued to be inactive. When in July we decided to move the headquarters of the First Army Group to the front in France, we had to change the number of this group to prevent the enemy from revealing our deception. As a result, the First Army Group became the 12th Army Group, and when the headquarters of the 12th Army Group departed for France, the fictitious First Army Group remained in England in accordance with our disinformation plan. At the head of this fictitious army group, we needed to put a real commander to give more plausibility to our deception. The War Office sent us General McNair as observer and fictitious commander. By this time, McNair had almost completed his task in the United States of manning and training a field army. Even now, I cannot understand why the enemy believed this apparent deception for so long. After all, after we had landed in Normandy, only a fool could have thought us capable of making the same gigantic effort in some other place. I can only explain it by the fact that the enemy thought we were much stronger than we really were. On the evening of 20 July, after dinner, I drove down the Columbia Road to the farmhouse where the First Army Headquarters had stationed its correspondence. The Press and Psychological Warfare Department of Headquarters had asked me to outline the plan of the forthcoming affair. After spending two languidly boring weeks in the Carantan marshes, the correspondence became a little more animated on 18 July, when Colette finally crossed the last few kilometres and captured a pile of ruins, all that remained of the town of St. The correspondents listened attentively to our outlined plan, craning their necks when I showed them the breakthrough area and shaking their heads when I told them what air forces we had been allocated. At the end of our conversation, one of the correspondents asked if we had warned the French living within the breakout area of the impending bombardment. I shook my head as if to avoid having to say no. Any hint we gave to the French would serve as a warning to the Germans. The enemy could withdraw, and while we were bombarding the empty space, he would gather reserves for a counterattack. The success of Operation Cobra depended on the suddenness of the action. Suddenness was absolutely essential, even if it resulted in the massacre of innocents. Another correspondent with a good-natured look pointed to Coutances, located 25 kilometres southwest of St. Lowe. How soon do you expect to get there this time? He asked. I was not expecting the question about the offensive that Middleton was leading, so I decided to cut it short. I think in 48 hours. Strongly surprised correspondent raised his eyes from his notebook. 26 kilometres in two days? I nodded my head, though with a sense of some unease, remembering that in the last two weeks we had rarely advanced more than 500 metres a day. A week later, I was told that I was wrong in my assumption by seven hours in time and three five hundred metres in distance. Waking up on Sunday 23 July, we again saw, as we had for the previous three days, a grey, cloud-covered sky. By this time, I had become irritable. I feared that information about the forthcoming operation will penetrate into the press, or the German command will begin to suspect something. Nurse. Damn it, I called Keen. I'll have the chaplain court marshalled if the weather doesn't change. I don't know if it was the Sunday afternoon or my ultimatum that helped, but late in the afternoon I was informed by radio from Stanmore that good weather was expected by noon tomorrow. Collins ordered his divisions to prepare, and an imperceptible shiver ran through the entire front of American troops. Despite the prediction of good weather for Monday, the morning was wet and clouds covered the sky. Along with Quesaday and Thorson, I travelled by jeep to Collins for a final check. I intended to stay with him for the duration of the bombardment and the first crucial hours of the offensive. By 11 o'clock, 30 mine, large clouds were still covering our objective. The heavy bombers took to the air, but at 11 RS as 40 men, that is 20 minutes before the start of the bombardment, they were radioed the order to return to the airfield. The attack was postponed for another 24 hours. Only after returning to the Army Command post, I learnt that a group of heavy bombers crossed the coast and dropped bombs on the target through the clouds. However, it turned out to be an underflight. The bombs fell on the positions of the 30th Division at a distance of more than one and a half kilometres from the bombing line. Yes, underflight. I shouted. But how could it happen? After all, the bombers were supposed to fly along the road to Peria parallel to our front line. They were not flying that way, sir, replied the Chief of Operations of the Headquarters. 
They approached the target at right angles to the front line. Lee Mallory reported to the command post a few minutes later. Although the number of casualties was not yet known, he, as well as I, was terribly distressed by this erroneous bombardment. But what worries me most, I told him, is that the heavy bombers flew over our heads instead of flying parallel to the road to Peria. I left Stanmore after it was clearly agreed that they would fly parallel to that road. Lee Mallory could not confirm the fact of this arrangement, as he was called from the meeting at Stanmore before it was over. Hmm. If they fly perpendicular to the road, I said, we're taking a hell of a risk, far greater than I could afford, as my troops are only a kilometre and a half away from the target. Lee Mallory promised to check immediately with the 8th Air Force commanders about the course of the aeroplanes. He did not call until 11.00. Thirty minutes past midnight, I waited for his call sat in the cramped cabin of a darkened van, keeping an eye on the clock hanging above my bunk. I've checked with the 8th headquarters, said the air marshal. They claim that the course the bombers flew today was no accident. They are planning to target perpendicular to our positions over the heads of our troops. Why? I asked. After all, they firmly promised us that they would fly parallel to the road to Peria. When we chose this place for the breakthrough, among other considerations, we also took this road into account. Hmm. Operations reported, Lee Mallory replied, that it would take more than two and a half hours to get 1,500 heavy bombers through the narrow corridor running parallel to the road to Peria. Have you insist on approaching the target along the Peria road? He added, they will not, they said, be able to strike tomorrow. There were only a few hours left until the bomber crews were to be instructed to take off in the early morning. I was astonished and angry at the response of Air Command, for I regarded it as a serious breach of the promises made to me when the plan of operation was drawn up. Five days ago I had left Stanmore in full confidence that the aeroplanes would fly a course along the road to Peria. If I had known in advance of the intention of Air Command to direct the planes to the target perpendicular to our positions, I would never have agreed to it. I did not want to risk the corps, because when dropping 60,000 bombs from a height of 2,500 metres, fractions of a second decide. As annoyed as I was that the Air Force planners had deceived me, I had no choice but to agree with them or postpone the attack indefinitely. But we had already made up our minds and could no longer delay the operation without giving away our intentions to the enemy. Shall I tell them to proceed in the morning? Lee Mallory asked. We have no other choice, I replied. The Butchies will gain a foothold in our front if we delay. But we are taking a terrible risk. One more inaccurate bomb drop could ruin everything. I thought for a moment. All right, so be it. We'll be ready to go on the offensive tomorrow morning. When I told Kiwisad about the change in the air plan, he was as amazed as I was. And when the first reports came in of aircraft approaching our positions on a perpendicular course, he refused to believe them. But after several witnesses confirmed the correctness of these reports, Quesada radioed Brereton, asked for an explanation. Brereton did not think to justify himself. Yes, that was the plan, he said, and Bradley knows about it. Brereton had obviously been misled by his staff. I knew nothing of this change until Lee Mallory called eleven hours after the first bombardment. Had I known, I would have withdrawn my troops further to the rear. Throughout the morning of 25 July, the air shook with the rumble of heavy bombers as I fretted at the telephone at Collins' command post. Eisenhower had flown across the channel again. He wanted to be with us at the moment of the breakthrough. After three days of postponement and a failed bombardment, the day before, our nerves were strained to the limit. Hardly had the rumbling of the bombardment died down when the reports of casualties began to come in. Thorson handed me the teletype reports. They're wrong again he said. No oh God, I cried out. Is this another underflight? He nodded his head and scrutinized the messages he still held in his hand. The aircraft had inflicted serious losses on the 9th and 30th divisions. Both divisions had suffered heavy damage, and as the bombers withdrew, reserves were hurriedly thrown into the gaps. Later that day, Collins informed me by telephone that McNair had been killed in the bombardment. In Tunisia, he had been seriously wounded while inspecting troops, and here, having travelled to the advancing battalion in the first echelon to inspect training, he had been killed by a direct bomb hit in a trench. Fearing that the news of McNair's death might interfere with our plan to rivet the enemy's attention to Pas de Calais, we buried McNair secretly two days later, 
the funeral being attended only by senior officers. Censorship orders were given to keep out reports of his death until a successor could be found to take McNair's place as commander of the defunct army group. On the evening Eisenhower flew to England, the outcome of Operation Cobra was still uncertain. Several hundred American soldiers had been killed and wounded by aerial bombardment by their aircraft. The bombing had thwarted Collins' offensive, and there was little reason to think that we were on the verge of success. Rather, the impression was given that the operation had failed. Two days later at a press conference, Brereton was forced to state that the insufficient pace of Operation Cobra was initially due to the slow progress of our ground troops. However, he did not see fit to add that the delay was due to the need to remove the dead and wounded Americans with whom the Allied Air Force had strewn our path. As concerned as I was, Ike was in an even more dejected state. That evening at the airfield, Eisenhower told his companion Captain Joseph Ryan of New York, Keane's indefatigable aide, that he would never again use heavy bombers against tactical targets. I don't think they can be used to support ground troops, he explained. That's the job of artillery. This time I gave permission, but I promise you that this is the last time. In the winter, however, we again demanded this support. For although on the evening of 25 July it might have seemed to us that Operation Cobra would end in failure, nevertheless the enemy was dealt a more devastating blow than we could have hoped for.